What's up, hockey fans, and welcome to another edition of Just Winging It, our quarantine coffee talk here from the Kalamazoo Wings. This is episode number eight, and before we introduce our guest uh, for today's show, I do want to recap kind of how we got to this point. We started with uh, the K-Wings governor and director of business operations, Tony Lentini-Daniels, moved along to the head coach of your K-Wings, Nick Bootland, in week two. Then we had the equipment manager on with his mustache and all, uh, Mitch McLeod, in week three, followed by former voice of the K-Wings, Joe Roberts, in week four. Uh, all of these very entertaining in their own right, so check them out if you missed the shows. They're all on our Facebook uh, under a Just Winging It playlist. But week five, we had the commissioner of the ECHL, Ryan Creelan, on to talk about kind of the state of things right now uh, during this lockdown. Uh, week six was K-Wings all-time franchise record holder for games played, Justin Taylor. And last week, we had former goaltender who has the wins record and, of course, now assistant coach Joel Martin. We're throwing you for a curveball and mixing it up this week because uh, we want to take you through the eyes of somebody who works the long, hard hours of pro sports. It's not as glamorous as a lot of people think, but uh, we're going to get into some uh, some of the front office staffers throughout this summer because it's a long summer, and uh, these people put in a lot of work, uh, long hours, as I said, um, and are very passionate about this team, just like all of you. So without further ado, our guest in week eight, Derek Arnold, the uh, manager of corporate sales for the Kalamazoo Wings. Thanks for doing this. How are you? Absolutely. I'm great. Thank you for having me. Uh, quite the uh, line of people for me to follow here, but uh, we'll, we'll take a swing at it and see how it goes. We saved you for the cleanup role, except it's yeah. not baseball. The cleanup section number eight. Yeah. Hopefully I can uh, do us some good here. Uh, you've, uh, we've seen a lot of each other actually this, this quarantine, because the, obviously the front office staff meets every week and we meet multiple times a week for our morning huddles. We have our happy hours every Friday afternoon for some light hearted conversation. Um, uh, but we haven't seen each other in person for a while. How are you holding up and uh, are you sick of your own furniture yet? <laughs> holding up well. Uh, I think I've put a good spot in on the, uh, the sofa. Uh, cause the girlfriend has kicked me from our office, uh, out to the living room so she can focus a little bit. Uh, so it has, uh, been a struggle here at home, but, uh, now that things are lightening up a little bit, we're able to get outside a little more. Uh, we spend a lot of time outside, so, uh, things are getting better as the weather gets better. Now, before we go any further, I want to let everybody know that normally we'd be dressed a little more professionally than we are right now, but both of us are dealing with the uh, effects of the barbershops being closed for the past eight weeks. So bear with us with the beards and uh, don't even want to show you the mess going on up here. So we've got the hats going on. Um, you were supposed to go camping this weekend from my understanding, and it's been raining cats and dogs the last, uh, the last few days. So is that still happening? Yeah, we're, uh, we're going to head up uh, tomorrow morning, uh, taking Friday to, to enjoy some of the good weather while we can, uh, cause it's supposed to clear up, up uh, where my family used to have a cottage in Ross common. So uh, I've got some roots up there a little bit. Uh, it's nice to get back to nature. We're going to, do some good hikes, uh, see the Asaba River, uh, Higgins Lake, and uh, get some uh, good good camp food going. Before we confuse anybody uh, any further, I just realized for those watching, we're doing this live Monday morning, but really we're recording on a Thursday. That's how it goes. Um, what's it like camping in quarantine? I, I'm not a big camper to begin with, but uh, during a pandemic, uh, what's what's that like? Uh, so we have been, uh, I won't say it's necessarily admitted the way we've been camping. Uh, we've been a little bit squatting when we've been able to get away to nature. Uh, but I have a, a car camping set. Uh, my girlfriend is definitely the one more apt with the, uh, outdoor living and all that sort of stuff. Uh, I'm kind of new to this game. So, uh, I'm starting to get the equipment. We're starting to get used to packing things up and, uh, how to strategically, play your trip so that you don't have to deal too much with the rain. So, uh, yeah, it's been uh, interesting. We did get up to the UP a few weeks ago. Uh, we went to uh, a couple of waterfalls, Jacob Falls, Arnold Mine Falls, uh, and then got all the way up to Copper Harbor, uh, where I spent some time as a kid way up uh, at the tippy top part of the Upper Peninsula. So uh, beautiful land up there, the North Country, uh, not Booter's North Country, but uh, our <laughs> North Country. Are you guys tent people or are you what I like to call more of the comfort campers? Uh, we're tent people usually, but uh, when you can get an air mattress in the back of the car, uh, it makes things a little bit nicer and you get those little comforts and amenities like uh, a cell phone with some Hulu on it. And it's uh, it's not too bad. I, I'm going to play the high maintenance card because uh, when I was uh, in seventh grade, our family took a long trip in an RV that we rented out to Yellowstone. 
uh, which was a blast. And I think part of the whole experience I enjoyed was the comfort of being in the RV and having the ability to take my contacts out and, uh, you know, the ability to be in a confined space. Um, I, I'm not very good at the whole camping thing other than that, but uh, a kudos to you for, for uh, taking in the whole experience. Do you have a favorite trip? You mentioned a bunch of them. Do you have a favorite spot you guys have gone? Uh, well, we uh, last summer, uh, right after we had started dating, I spent a lot of my career out on the East Coast, which I'm sure we'll get into a little bit later. But uh, uh, I have some roots set out in Maine. So I got to take Allison out to Maine for the first time. And uh, we got up to Acadia and uh, the, the uh, Mount Desert Island. It's a beautiful spot right on the coast. You get uh, some, some top topography. You get the mountains there. So it's a beautiful spot. It's probably one of the best spots we've been. Uh, in state, my girlfriend will say that uh, we've got a little secluded beach on the north side of Grand Island that uh, not too many people know about up in Lake Superior. Uh, she'll call that the best campsite that we've ever been to. The last time I saw you, you were you were just finishing up the keto diet because, and just a little backstory, everybody in the office had a competition to see who could lose the most weight to get us ready for league meetings, which now we don't know about this summer with everything going on, but uh, I think you might've won or you were one of the front runners. You did a great job. And the reason I want to ask you about it is because I've tried the keto diet before and it's one of the hardest things I've ever done. So first of all, how was the uh, lockdown affected uh, your, your keto diet? Yeah. Uh, so we did have that competition. Uh, Tony will uh, be upset to tell you that I slid into first place at the last <laughs> second. Uh, right at the, the buzzer there with uh, a little fasting. So uh, I, I don't know our rules or what we set up for that. So uh, I, I might have bent the rules a little bit there. But uh, it, it was my second bout with keto. Uh, both bouts together, I've lost 110 pounds. So uh, a little bit of that weight came back after the first bout. But uh, it's been uh, my go-to diet. It's My girlfriend hates it because it completely <laughs> changes the, the cabinets and uh, what we're stocking up in the house here. But um, it's, it works well for me. Uh, I think you gotta have, you really gotta analyze yourself. So it's, it's a personal diet. It's a personal choice. It's not for everybody. And I'm the first person to tell you that, but, uh, having a diet that consists 70% of animal fats is, uh, is not for everybody, but you eat a lot of bacon, which is great. Uh, a lot of steak, um, and just good veggies, Brussels sprouts, asparagus. So, uh, it's worked well for me. Um, and, and it keeps me healthy and fit with on top of the hiking and whenever I can get out to play a little golf. For those that have never heard of it, I swear it is no joke. I did it for one month. I lost 14 pounds. I was happy about that, but it was the most miserable month because I think some of the luxuries that we, uh, we eat normally are the ones that you really miss out. Like this is going to sound really dumb, but I'm just going to say it anyway because that's, you know, I have no filter. My biggest thing that I missed when I did the keto diet was the rice at Chipotle because you can go to Chipotle and eat a salad and still order the same things, but the rice you can't. And so I, I, it's just such a small thing, but uh, anyway, it was uh, very productive and kudos to you for, for being so good at it this last go around uh, back you. to the start. When did you decide you wanted to work in sports? Was that a light bulb moment or was it something you'd, you'd always wanted to do when you were a kid? Because in your specific role, I think the story always is, is different. Yeah, uh, pretty unique. Uh, I had actually originally went to college for marine biology. Uh, so that's what I thought I was going to do uh, for my entire youth, my adolescence. Uh, I had taken specialized classes in high school for marine biology, oceanography. Uh, so I was really trying to guide my life down that route. Uh, unfortunately, once you get into college and start taking those classes, you realize that it's not all about hanging out in the ocean and being on a boat. So uh, some of those science classes may have got at me a little bit. And uh, in my second my second year of uh, marine biology, I decided that uh, for my best interest moving forward, I wasn't sure uh, what the future would tell for for marine biology. That that making a move to sports uh, was the right move for me. Not only because I love sports and played sports through college. Um, but also because uh, the high school that I came from here in Michigan, Detroit Country Day, uh, great history of athletics, uh, most uh, state championships in the state. Um, so it's uh, a great school. And uh, I knew that if I went into sports coming out of that high school, I'd probably have a successful career. So strategic a little bit. Is sports everything you thought it would be? I mean, is it all puppies and rainbows and unicorns like people think? Uh, it's not all puppies, unicorns and rainbows. Uh, fortunately, 
Uh, earlier in my career, I, I didn't have any formal training when I had first started this. Uh, I had kind of done internships coming out of college. I worked in alcohol for a long time, uh, ending my stint in booze with uh, uh, Bacardi USA in Las Vegas. Uh, so I did some marketing and promotion out there. Uh, and then I got the chance to break back into sports and I, I had missed sports and realized that that's what I wanted to do. So I uh, moved all the way back from Vegas to Maine again uh, and got my start with the Portland Pirates there. And uh, it was not easy. Nobody taught me what to do. Uh, they pretty much gave me a list of people and said, start calling, selling packages. And I was like, what's a ticket package? Like I had never bought a ticket package in my life. So uh, to have zero training and have to figure it out on your own, I remember in 2012, taking that scrap piece of paper uh, and just writing out my own script for the first time to know how to talk to people. Uh, so I was selling small packages at the start, account executive, internships. Uh, then I moved to the Devils, uh, and there was opportunities for advancement with the Devils. So uh, I was just willing to, to kind of take a strategic approach for the business and uh, fortunate that I've had a lot of people guide me and, and develop my leadership and, and kind of make me a well-rounded person in this industry. Uh, so I'm very fortunate, uh, and then I can't thank enough the people around me uh, because I can't do my job without the people that help me out, especially you and and Tim Bits behind the scenes there. But uh, it's all, all the people that help you along the way that make you appreciate every day in this business. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna come right out and say that what you do, being the corporate sales manager, uh, in my opinion, is one of the most challenging positions in a within a pro sports team because I've done it. I've done the ticket sales side. I've done the creative side, the broadcasting. Um, and our team with Kalamazoo, what makes us so unique is how close we all are and how we collaborate uh, on a lot of ideas and work together. But there really is a sales team and a creative team. But I think the person in your role has to really be creative with the way that you work with different companies on their initiatives, with the way that you incorporate different uh, elements into that partnership. Um, there has to be a creative side to what you do. What's the most challenging part of it? Uh, I would say it's it's probably the intangible stuff a little bit. Um, I, I'm always like a student of this industry. So I always want to learn what what that team is doing that we haven't done yet that we can innovate from. Uh, it's it's really hard to recreate the wheel and there's very or to, to create the wheel in this business. Uh, and there's very few people doing it. A lot of people innovating off of other people's ideas. So uh, just being a student all the time. Um, but I would say the the intangible quality of being able to think on my feet, and that's attributed to just knowing what other teams are doing, being able to offer things uh, in a meeting when a company says, hey, we need an, a way to reach this audience. Um, you've got to shift. Sometimes you've got plans in those meetings, and you've got a certain pitch or a certain uh, asset or a piece of inventory that you want a company on, and you've got to shift and move really quickly uh, like milliseconds we're talking about to be able to, to reposition. So that's really, really tough part of my job. You worked at the higher level. You were with the Albany Devils for a while. Now they're the Binghamton Devils, uh, part of the New Jersey system. What's the biggest difference between that experience and this one? And, and what was the biggest thing you learned? Yeah, uh, working in the American League was fantastic. It's an unbelievable league, very tight-knit league. Uh, I learned a lot of what I do today from that league. So uh, work with the Pirates, work with the Al Albany Devils. So two franchises actually uh, no longer exist in their original right that I worked for. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but <laughs> uh, to be able to, um, in Albany, it was uh, a tough market because there was an original fan base there, the, the River Rats, a historic fan base, a very unique logo, and the city was passionate there. Um, Working for New Jersey was awesome. So you had all the resources in the world, got to go down to Newark to the Prudential Center, experience their game presentations, um, stuff like that. So learned a lot from them and they just had the resources to be able to invest in us. Um, but at this level, it's it's more about community um, and, and our ownership group is passionate about West Michigan. So the, the comparing and contrasting, it's vastly different, but uh, great groups in both parts. Uh, we wish we could have kept the team there in Albany. There's a very, very tight core knit of fans there uh, that I know miss hockey uh, very much. So uh, it, it was a great market while we were there. The building, Times Union Center, great facility. We were a tenant of that facility where we own Wings Event Center here. So uh, another comparison there to when you're just leasing out a space and you don't get to sell advertising everywhere you want. You don't get to be uh, completely creative and innovative and have full autonomy in what you don't want to do with the venue. 
Uh, so you have to be creative in that way and work with your partners uh, at that level too. So uh, very, very different. Is there a better view in, in Wings Event Center, other than listening to me talk for three hours, is there a better view than sitting up in the press box, looking down at the ice from center ice? And did you ever think that being a part of our social media game day team would be a part of your job description? Uh, this is a new one for the uh, the, the resume, for sure, uh, being asked to, to hop on social. Uh, but it's something I've had a lot of fun with. Uh, it is a great seat in the house, and uh, I'm fortunate that I've been able to to kind of explore the different views in the arena, but I'll say uh, top center ice is probably the best seat in the house. Uh, sometimes you like to get a little low behind the nets and see the play develop, but watching that big grand view with the, the beautiful scoreboard above it, you can't beat it. And just for those wondering, that uh, that tweet on 90s night that sparked uh, an all-out rivalry war? That wasn't me. <laughs> I'm throwing you right under the bus. That was hilarious. Um, and, and gosh, I have nothing but good things to say about our friends over in Fort Wayne, but we like to poke fun every now and then, right? Of course. It's a good rivalry. That's what social media is all about. We're just having good fun. Yeah, exactly. You know, kudos to you because I never would have figured that out. Um, actually, in the, in the back of my mind, I was thinking what you were thinking. Anyway, back to, back to the task at hand. Uh, Leslie David Baker from the show The Office came to Kalamazoo this year, and I thought it was really cool meeting him and, and seeing him uh, in attendance. I became a fan of the show recently. Um, I, I hadn't ever watched it before I found out he was coming here, and so I wanted to binge watch the show. But one of the cool things we did, you really kickstarted and, and saw the way through, was having a meet and greet opportunity with our corporate partners to meet him in a, a special VIP um you know, event before the game started. What was that all about? And, and um, how cool was that to see come through? It was fantastic. Uh, sometimes you get these opportunities and you're able to work with a, a promoter or a celebrity that, that is willing to take these opportunities to, to appreciate and give us the ability to, to be flexible in our experience. So uh, our corporate partners, obviously we, we need corporate partners. We need uh, community support, whether it be national or local. Uh, from business partners to keep this franchise running. Uh, they don't, they, they are a massive piece of our business. So uh, to be able to show appreciation for them is, is something that we have to do. Uh, we do it annually with our golf outing at Millum. Uh, we love hosting that for the corporate partners every year. Um, but this was an opportunity, something special, something once in a lifetime uh, to, to get the corporate partners down there treat them some food, some drink, uh, and, and have a good night. I actually didn't even get to spend too much time with Leslie because I was running around uh, shaking hands with everybody. But uh, we had some uh, potentially new businesses that uh, might be popping up at Wings Event Center there that night as well. So uh, they got to see what it's like uh, to be a part of corporate life with the K-Wings. So. My next question was actually the corporate golf outing which is a blast every year. And I don't think people realize how much work goes into the planning and the organizing and seeing it all the way through that you do primarily. I mean, most of that weight is on your shoulders, but I was going to ask you about how your golf game is, is doing since we've been locked down for the last eight weeks and the course finally opened up or, or we can golf, I guess, at a distance. Are you confident that you can get it back to its mid season form? Uh, it might need a little work. Uh, I will say that our league kicked off uh, on Tuesday down at Millum, and uh, Joe Pryor there, he must be rolling out the greens real well because uh, I was shooting probably about 30 feet past the, each, each pin there. Uh, but the golf game, we'll tweak it out a little bit. I, I can't seem to rein in the driver right now, so uh, working on uh, just keeping the short game. And then it's been interesting. I'm trying to take tips from how we do uh, our normal life in this current environment. So uh, I've actually dropped out half of my irons out of my bags. I'm only playing with my my odd irons to lighten things up while I carry my bag around. So uh, it's been uh, an experiment. We have a question from a fan. Are you ready? Yeah. Cameron wants to know, when you're working on pieces to a sponsorship with a company, like some longtime partners we've had, like uh, Culver's or Hungry Howie's, um, sorry, free, free plug, uh, two, of my, two of my favorites. Um, what, how do you, how do you land on some of the pieces that incorporate what fans could get like a, a food giveaway, or if the team scores a certain amount of goals, they get this coupon. Um, cause he was wondering if we could bring the concrete mixers back, which, you know, I've been to Culver's recently and those are pretty great. 
They're really great. And, and Cameron is not the first person to ask where the concrete mixers have gone. Uh, the way that those partnerships get built is obviously, uh, you mentioned earlier, we take a lot of approaches and, and I like to build our partnerships off of pillars. Um, so we have a few different ways uh, to market and, and have their brand uh, be have a presence in the facility. So uh, those return on investment pieces where we're giving away something to the fans, whether it be the Hungry Howies after we score five goals or whenever we score on the, uh, the power play, uh, those are an opportunity for Culver's to receive some business back off of their investment. So uh, we have a, a sus uh, we suspect that uh, when you go to Culver's and get that, that free shake, uh, that you're probably going to get a burger or fries or some chicken tenders or uh, my personal favorite, the, uh, the fried cheese curds. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so you're probably going to buy something else there and, and Culver's appreciates the business. So uh, those are actually uh, accounts that I took over before my time. Uh, those were those were built. So now I sit down in renewal conversation with those partners and say, what's working? What's not working? Um, what's the feedback from the year prior? So uh, I think Culver's uh, that that concrete, they must be dumping a little extra cash into that because they're they're holding that tight to the chest. So. I think it's just going to be shakes for the foreseeable future, but uh, I will take Cameron's note and try to negotiate that back into the deal. We'll, we'll see. We're here with Derek Arnold, the corporate sales manager of the Kalamazoo Wings. Uh, real quick, funny story, I guess, if you will, uh, just tell you about who I am. Um, my first time coming to Kalamazoo as a visitor, my, my rookie season in Evansville, so it was the 14, or no, 15, 16 season. The thing I was most excited about when I got to Wings Event Center and I saw Joe Roberts across the way and I was walking around the building was there was a Hungry Howie's booth because the only experience I had with Hungry Howie's was in college. There was one on campus and we used to always order like at two in the morning, you know, at the end of a weekend night. So I was like, I've never heard that it was a, a chain that was well known, but in Michigan, obviously it is. So anyway, the first time I came to Kalamazoo, I was like, when are we playing the K-Wings next? Because I can't wait to get some more of that. Uh, yeah. Amanda, all right. and been long I'm, I'm, all, I'm all done. I'm all done. Uh, <laughs> how's your stock portfolio going right now? And it's not meant as a knock because I know a lot of people are serious about it, but you've kind of made it a hobby to follow the stock market, something I've always wanted to do, but I'm not smart enough to do. So how are you holding up? Well, uh, as some of you in the office know, there's, there's a few things that I'm not willing to put a couple bucks on. So uh, I love... <laughs> A little little gambling here and there on sports, uh, and without sports taking place right now, the only thing left to, to get action on is the stock market. So uh, I have gotten into the stock market a little bit, um, but more I just know it's a safe decision right now because when things are low, uh, it's the time to, to dip your feet in. So uh, I've got my eyes on a couple things, but uh, the, the portfolio as of the last couple of days has taken a hit, but uh, I, I'm I'm not losing money. Let's just say that. Good. I hope I didn't just get you in trouble. I hope I didn't spill any beans that you didn't want out there. No. Um, no. Okay. Last one I have. Uh, what is a, a dream job look like for someone like yourself? Are you are you working your dream job? Is this what you're happiest doing? Or is it something like, for instance, a hockey player wants to get to the NHL. They could love Kalamazoo like, like the next person. A broadcaster, I love Kalamazoo. It's a blast here. It's one of the, my favorite places I've lived. My ultimate goal is to get to the NHL. Is that the same for someone in your role or, or are you living your dream job? Uh, I think earlier in my career, my, my answer was definitely different than it is today. Um, when I was a young pup, I, I wanted to, to chase that NHL drop job, uh, go sell corporate partnerships in a big, big arena for millions and millions of dollars annually. Uh, those price tags, I've seen what they look like and boy, oh boy, would those commissions be nice. But uh, <laughs> I will say that, Again, like being in Kalamazoo, being able to move around at this point in my career, uh, I've been able to experience different parts of the country, uh, different business models within the sports uh, environment. Um, and ownership in Kalamazoo is fantastic. Our business across the board, uh, some people don't know this, but we are not just K-Wings. We are GHG Enterprise. Uh, we have the facility out at Wings West, so I actually manage uh, Dasher boards and ICE logos uh, inventory over there as well for partners. Um, but uh, our ownership group here in Kalamazoo is rooted, and I finally found a spot where I kind of want to dig my feet in a little bit. And again, me and my girlfriend both live out here. She works at Wolverine just north of uh, Grand Rapids. So uh, to be 
in an environment where I see opportunity for growth and development, and we have a passionate fan base here. Uh, that was one thing I did before I came here was I went into the community and asked people if they were hockey fans here because I wanted to see what I was coming into because I had never been here. So uh, this this fan base makes me want to stay here. This organization makes me want to stay here, and and I think this is where I'm pretty happy spending uh, the, the future of my career. Well, thanks for doing this. Uh, just winging it. Uh, this was a lot of fun. You're a trendsetter. Now now that you, we, we reached the cleanup hitter, uh, I'm, I'm excited to see who the next few uh, batters in the lineup are. So uh, thanks for doing this, Derek. Uh, keep up the, uh, the great work and stay safe up there. I'm looking forward to seeing you at the office soon. Yeah, John, thank you very much. And uh, you have a good uh, rest of your time until I can see you again.